Welcome to worship at St. Paul's Lutheran Church here on Super Bowl Sunday. Having a little fun. I know folks will be here in their Eagles gear. As a Minnesota native, I don't have Eagles gear, but I'm wearing my Someday shirt as a Vikings fan. On a heavier note, uh, we are also responding to the disaster in Turkey and Syria. Lutheran World Relief has people on the ground, especially in Turkey. If you'd like to make a gift to support their immediate efforts, you can go to our webpage to the giving section and make a gift uh, to help support the, the response to the disaster there. Now, let us join in worship. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. O God, the strength of all who put their trust in you, mercifully accept our prayers, and because in our weakness we can do nothing good without you, give us the help of your grace, that in keeping your commandment we may please you, both in will and deed, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns, with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The Holy Gospel and text for today's sermon according to Matthew, the fifth chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, you've heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you're angry with your brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. If you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you're offering your gift at the altar, 
If you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister, then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him. Or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you'll never get out until you've paid the last penny. The Gospel of the Lord. not often Abe Lincoln's birthday falls on a Sunday. It last happened in 217, and our preacher that day was Will Willimon, the longtime dean and preacher at the Duke University Chapel, and he never mentioned Lincoln. I like to think that Lincoln would be very much at home here at St. Paul's. He loved the King James Bible, and he never, never for an instant, left his brain parked outside the church. He was always questioning. I can think of no president before or since, and it's been 214 years that he was born today. I can think of no president before or since who was more attuned to the pain and sorrow of his people and able to interpret more eloquently this sorrow and pain to the biblical motifs of judgment, punishment, justice, mercy, and reconciliation. Lincoln knew what few modern politicians seem to know, that questions are more important than answers. Lincoln, in char characteristic humility, once said, my concern is not whether God's on my side, but whether I'm on God's side. And he struggled with that all his life. Lincoln thought often about the passage in the book of Exodus. The sins of the fathers are visited upon the sons and unto the children's children. He wondered day and night if the Civil War was God's judgment on the nation for slavery. And he was never sure. It cost him many a sleepless night. He was quite convinced, however, that life was consequential. God is not mocked. We reap what we sow, what the fire gets, the fire gives. He believed the world swings on ethical hinge. Loosen that hinge and all of history, nature too will feel the shock. Individuals and nations don't break the Ten Commandments. They're broken on them, as Chesterton put it. If you fall off a cliff, you don't break the law of gravity, you prove it. Lincoln said all of this, but he said it without any arrogance, with not even a trace of pomposity. Today, so many of our politicians, they seem to know exactly how God feels about birth control and abortion and capitalism and free enterprise and socialism and prayer in the schools and gay marriage and gay flags and college curriculum, high school books to be read, sexual orientation. They know it all. They have all the answers. But Lincoln's questioning mind was always skeptical of such certainty and at the same time, he was always receptive to the coming of new evidence. I hear politicians say, for example, life begins at conception. And this is a biological fact. And yet even Roman Catholic theologians, the stature, for example, of Father Drennan of Georgetown, he would say that potential life is different than actual life. He would differentiate biological life from human life, bio from zoe, two words, as you know, both having to do with life, but one is biological, one is zoological, botany, zoology, subtle differences. The, these theologians, many of them in our leading Catholic universities, they would want to talk about the motive in abortion. 
Some would argue that legal abortion means fewer deaths than illegal abortion. But these nuances, these subtleties, the complexity here, it's missing when we hear, as we so often do, simplistic answers to complex questions. I heard one woman on the left go on television and say abortion should be legal, legal and safe, but she never said rare. And of course that inflamed extremist on the right. Where's the nuance, the complexity? Lincoln was always grappling with this. Complexity, nuance, subtlety. And Lincoln's stories reveal so much about his character and his personality. One thinks of the pilot on a Mississippi River boat who was asked how long he'd been on the job. 26 years, he replied. Oh, then you know where all the rocks are, all the shoals and the sandbars. No, said the pilot, but I know where the deep waters are. A story like this is so Lincoln-esque. There was nothing trivial about Lincoln, cliches pious religious phrases never fell from his lips. Yes, Lincoln doubted many religious dogmas never belonged to any particular church, although he was in church often. He often sometimes would be in the uh, pastor's office in New York Avenue Presbyterian and even on weekday services. But this doubting only made him more acutely aware of the religious realities behind the dogmas. Take forgiveness, for example, certainly at the heart of our faith, with malice toward none, with charity to all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right. Let us strive on to finish the work we're in, to bind up, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who has borne the battle, for the widow, and his orphan to do all which may achieve and cherish a just, lasting peace among ourselves and all nations. I have no doubt that today's gospel lesson was often on Lincoln's mind. Before you offer your gift at the altar, first be reconciled to your brother and sister, come to terms with your accuser while you're on the way to court. Now, Fred Craddock, that great Southern preacher and New Testament scholar who taught for years at Emory, he says of this text, pay attention to your life now. Attending to one's relations to God and to a fellow member of the community are often experientially the same. I think Craddock's right. You can't separate the vertical, the horizontal from the vertical. No time, he says, for business as usual, when personal relations go wrong, in nine cases out of 10, immediate action will mend them. But if that immediate action is not taken, they'll continue to deteriorate. Bitterness will spread in an ever widening circle, an ever widening circle. It's so true. If, if we act immediately, maybe we can have reconciliation, but the longer we wait, the deeper and wider and more difficult it becomes. That's what Jesus is saying. I think that's true. And Lincoln understood. No wonder Robert E. Lee was in tears when Lincoln received his surrender with unprecedented kindness, grace, and magnanimity, with malice toward none, with charity for all. Of course, Lincoln, even when he was most serious, never forgot the importance of humor. Indeed, humor is part of life and part of faith. If faith takes care of the ultimate incongruities of life, then humor helps with the penultimate, the immediate ones. As Nietzsche put it, and I'll never forget his words, he said, man is the only animal who suffers so excruciatingly that if there were no humor in the universe, we would be forced to create it. Lincoln knew this. It's impossible to read Lincoln's speeches or any of the biographies about him 
And there are so many good ones. That quote on the cover of the bulletin I took from Carl Sandburg. That must be four volumes. Um, here it is in, in, in one volume. And then probably the best uh, single biography is David Herbert Donald's one volume biography of Lincoln. And there are several others. Alan Gelzo, who taught at Gettysburg and now is at Princeton, has written much about the faith of Lincoln. In all these biographies, Lincoln's sense of humor always comes out. It's impossible to understand Lincoln without this incredible sense of humor. Lincoln, for example, never got along with his in-laws. Once after leaving them, he remarked to his wife, one D was enough for God, but it took two Ds to spell Todd. Lincoln, maybe in some way, was not the perfect husband. According to Donald, he would often be reading. Poor Mary would be alone all day with the children. She'd want to talk about adult conversation, but Lincoln was always reading. So she'd try once, he didn't hear. Try twice, he didn't hear. Try three times, he didn't hear. So she went to the fireplace, took a piece of uh, burning wood and put it to his nose, and that got his attention, um, apparently. I wonder if he handled that with humor. <laughs> or take Lincoln's relationship with his arrogant general, George McClellan, who came from a rich Philadelphia family, West Point graduate. There was little humility in McClellan's DNA. He said he came to Washington to save the Union. I'm the only one who can fix it. He wrote to his wife, I am the power in the land. Many historians feel he suffered a messiah complex. Lincoln and Seward went to his home. McClellan ignored them, went to bed. Lincoln, as always, was looking at the bigger picture. He said, I will hold McClellan's horse if only he will bring us success. But McClellan, he was always thinking and analyzing and not acting, never taking risks, not able to move. He was always majoring in preparation. And this was hard on Lincoln, who abhorred his self-righteousness. And after reading several dispatches from young General McClellan, all of which began, headquarters in the saddle, headquarters in the saddle, Lincoln remarked to members of his cabinet, it's strange that the general keeps his headquarters where most people put their hindquarters. Lincoln struggled with depression, melancholy all his life. I think one of the great geniuses of Lincoln is that he could still function with all that he dealt with. And Mary was always emotionally disturbed. And with all he dealt with at home, he could still function. He never got over the death of his young son, Willie. In those days, you lost children. And Lincoln and Mary were just absolutely emotionally distraught over the death of their children. When in 1859, Stephen Douglas was reelected senator, Lincoln was steeped in gloom. And he said, I'm like a little boy who stubbed his toe. I'm too old. I'm too old to cry. And it hurts too much to laugh. Melancholy thrust off with self-deprecating humor. What a wonderful example Lincoln gave us. To one of his friends, John Kennedy once gave a silver mug on which was inscribed, there are three things that are real. God, human folly, and laughter. The first two are beyond our comprehension, so we must do what we can with the third. He's so right. One of my favorite columnists, Sidney Harris, once quipped, only the humorist is truly serious. Laughter is what distinguishes us from the rest of creation. Indeed, God himself is something of a humorist. Else, why the duck-billed platypus? Laughter is a tranquilizer with no side effects. Luther said, if you're not allowed to laugh in heaven, I don't want to go there. 
wonderful stuff. Our young people will be taking their first communion at 11 o'clock. And one of the things I want to stress with them is, how do you keep your mind focused as you come to the altar? I mean, especially today. I mean, I've been reading a lot of papers uh, on what's happening this afternoon. And uh, it's tough. The library, they were stealing papers, so you have to sign them out one by one. And uh, sometimes people get a paper I want to read. Yesterday, a fellow was falling asleep over the Wall Street Journal and not bringing it back. And I thought, do I shake him and say, I don't think you're reading that paper, sir? You know, uh, and I got one fellow who gives me a paper. I have another person who trusts me to take two at a time. It's rough, but from what I'm reading, Many people are going to think, you know, is somebody going to fall on her shoulder or fall on Mahomes' ankle? You know, you're going to be thinking of that. Or another sports writer said yesterday, well, what about, um, what about the second quarterback on each team? That's how the game's going to be settled tonight. But when you come to the Lord's table, as you will next week, maybe we have to think first using our text in mind. Is there someone where I need some immediate reconciliation as I come to the altar? And as the bread is distributed, we can think about that. And then when the wine comes, we remember that God always gives us another chance. Don't put a period where God is putting a comma. His grace always gives us another chance. And maybe if we think about that, when we come for the bread, we think of how we maybe need to do better somewhere. And when the wine comes, we think of God's grace that enables us. Maybe then we can keep our minds focused and always behind it all is laughter. The laughter of knowing that history is still his story, that God will not be ultimately defeated. I love that verse in Psalm 30. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. I like what Robert Alter, that great Jewish scholar, how he renders this text in his translation of the book of Psalms. At evening, one beds down weeping, and in the morning, glad song. That's our faith, joy in the morning. In Eugene O'Neill's play, Lazarus Laugh, the Lazarus who has tasted death and sees it for what it is, whose joy in living is irresistible, whose invitation to the world is his infectious cry, laugh with me, death is dead, fear no more, there is only life, there is only laughter. So no more sad and gloomy faces with Lincoln. Born 214 years ago this very day, thrust off your melancholy and sadness with humor. And for your Lenten penance this year, please look redeemed. Be my, be my, be my.
us pray. O oh God, we thank you this day for that child of the South who became a leader of the North, on whose shoulders fell the mantle of great responsibility. We thank you for his understanding heart and whimsical humor. May something of his spirit indwell our leaders, that they too may see the country as a whole and not be governed by pressure from this group or that, but may seek the common good and your will for us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, with so much bitterness in our world, help us who own your name to shed abroad your love. With malice toward none and charity toward all, help us to be gentle, walking softly with one another. Help us to be understanding, lest we add to the world's sorrow. In a bruised and broken world, help us to be ministers of mercy and ambassadors of kindness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh Lord, we thank you for mercies that come to us disguised or reach us in roundabout ways. New people who entered our lives, expanded our horizons and made us the better for their friendship. Some prize that toppled from our grasp as we strained to reach it, causing us to change course and in the changing to discover life itself. Explosive arguments that routed sham, located issues and made authentic meeting possible. For these and other backdoor mercies, we give you thanks. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, forgive us the tunnel vision that cannot see the stars, the exaltation of the immediate that blinds us to abiding truth, where we want too much to happen too quickly, temper our passion with patience, give us the poise that belongs to faith, and overcome our doubts with a vision of the kingdom that Jesus taught and was. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear us as we pray for all who are in need. We think especially this morning of victims of this terrible earthquake and all who have suffered so dreadfully. Hear us and help us to minister to them as best we can. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear us as we remember those whom we've loved and lost. They are still so dear to us. Hear us as we remember them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these words, however broken, we offer you through Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>